In November 1993, Defense Minister General Sani Abacha Force Chief MS Shunekono side and became the head of state and commander-in-chief of the armed forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. By mid-1998, after ruling for almost five years, Nigeria under him had attained a terrible image of gross human rights violations, political and other extrajudicial killings as well as forced disappearance of opponents of the regime became common. Most Nigerians had begun to lose hope in their country and return to prayers. In this edition of Hispo Media, we re-examine the five-year reign of General Sani Abacha and answer the question, was General Sani Abacha a tyrant or was he misrepresented? Please come with me, Gabriel here. Please note, this video is inspired by comments on my previous video, the last 24 hours of General Sani Abacha. Another video in this series, why many people see him as a good man, is coming shortly after this. But first. Born on the 20th of September 1943, Sani Abacha was originally a Kanuri from Borno State, but was born and raised in Kanu, northwestern Nigeria. He was commissioned into the Nigerian Army in 1963 after he had attended a Mons Defense Officers Cadet Training College in Aldershot, England. But before then, Sani Abacha had attended the Nigerian Military Training College in Kaduna State. Just three years into his commission in the army, Abacha took part in the conceptual stages of the Northern Counter Coup of July 1966. He is also alleged to have participated in the Lagos or Abiokuta phases of the January 1966 coup. Abacha rose through the ranks to a full general in the army without skipping a single rank and was regarded by many as a master coup planner and executioner. When the crisis of June 12 arose in 1993, Babangida stepped aside and set up an interim national government headed by Chief Ernest Shunekon. But Babangida left behind General Sani Abacha as Defense Minister. This was more or less a setup for the ING. As expected, less than three months into the life of the ING, on 17th of November 1993, General Sani Abacha forced Shunekon to resign. Abacha installed himself as head of state and commander-in-chief of the armed forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. This would mark the beginning of his five-year reign. But the question is, was General Sani Abacha's regime a tyranny or has he been misrepresented? But before we address this point, kindly take a moment to book the like button on this video and subscribe to his Hispan Media. Thank you. During his five-year rule over Nigeria, General Sani Abacha left behind arguably one of the worst records of brutality in the history of the country. He represented the climax of all that was wrong with the Nigerian military's monopoly of power since independence in 1960 to that time. But was everything about his regime all bad? I will come back to that in a moment or in another video. But first. Even though his military predecessors were known to be high-handed and brutal, General Sani Abacha appeared to be the most brutal and most insecure of all. His insecurity was such that Abacha hardly traveled out of the new capital Abuja to visit other parts of the country, and whenever he dared do so, it was for very brief moments. He was very secretive and became highly unpopular. Sani Abacha spent enormous resources on the state security service and his carefully selected strike force and enabled them to mount extensive surveillance on prominent Nigerians, whether they were civilians or military, especially those whom the regime felt uncomfortable with. By this means, he had begun to create a real sense of distrust among Nigerians. They became afraid to discuss politics openly, an activity that has been their pastime since political independence. Under Abacha's regime, complaining publicly was a basis for arrest and prolonged detention without trial. Academics and journalists were often seized in their homes at midnight and put into prolonged detention without trial. In an effort to completely silence criticism and opposition, General Sani Abacha suspended the Nigerian right of legal defense. He banned all forms of political protest, destroyed the trade unions, and systematically clamped all suspected opponents into prison. 
those imprisoned were subjected to very harsh conditions. By the time of Abaja's sudden death, the list of Nigerians in prison looked inexhaustible. The list included members of trade unions, journalists, academics, and other vocal professionals, human rights advocates, and even military men whom the regime distrusted. Worse still, political opponents frequently disappeared while others were gone down in broad daylight. Two notable examples were the assassination of Kudurat Abiola, the vocal wife of Chief Moshud Abiola, and Chief Alfred Rewani. Despite paying lip service, the government showed little or no interest in investigating these murders. At this time, the reign of terror was fully in place. But it did not stop there. General Sani Abacha intended to destroy all institutions of democracy and justice in the country. On August 24, 1994, the military government promulgated decrees which put its actions beyond legal challenge in the courts. His target on the judiciary also included intimidation and appointment of cronies into the Supreme Court. The regime constantly disregarded court orders as well. Because of General Sani Abacha's insecurity, he surrounded himself with psychophant heads who never told him any bad news. In addition to his domestic economic mismanagement, General Sani Abacha's disregard for international public opinion made Nigeria a pariah state. Two key decisions of the regime brought this to the fore. First, the execution of Ken Sarawiwa and eight other Ogonis, and second, the trump up charges of subversion and treason against a respected former head of state, General Lushigun Basinjo, and his former deputy, General Shehu Musa Yaradua. Yaradua eventually died in prison of suspected poisoning. On December 11, 1995, a meeting between Abacha and American unofficial envoy, Representative Bill Richardson, confirmed that Abacha was oblivious of his administration's reputation abroad. He asked Abacha, quote, think of your role in history, and reminded him, quote, you are known as a murderer of Ken Sarowiwa. Abacha's final step in destroying the chances of genuine democracy in Nigeria was to invade civil society through a massive misuse of public funds. He bought up traditional rulers and financed endless spontaneous solidarity public rallies. For those rallies, jobless youths and intimidated public servants were transported to state capitals in order to pledge their support for the general. This happened almost every other week. They presented petitions calling for Abacha to remain as president. For instance, on March 25, 1997, Lagos State Obas and leading chiefs rather infamously declared support for Abacha's government at a public rally. Participants in these rallies presented their solidarity messages to the ever-ready and ever-welcoming state military administrators. However, at the same time, public protests by ordinary citizens were not allowed in any part of the country. Those that took place against all threats by the police were brutally put down. As General Sani Abacha consolidated his grip on power, the list of political detainees grew as long as the list of prominent Nigerians who had fled into self-exile. On the 12th of March 1997, the government placed charges of treason on Anthony Nahoru, Chief Olufalai, Professor Wolushenka, General Kinrinade, and others. Meanwhile, the regime had begun preparation for democratic transition. On December 12, 1995, an eight-member National Electoral Commission of Nigeria, NECON, was inaugurated. The next day, Abacha set up a Transition Implementation Committee TIC, to supervise the transition process. Almost a year later, on September 38, 1996, NECON announced the registration of five political parties under Steve guidelines. Between April 16 to 28, 1998, all but one of the five registered political parties adopted Abacha as consensus candidate for the presidential elections. However, on May 1, 1998, United Action for Democracy UAD organized a public protest against the adoption of Abacha as consensus candidate. 
but the protest was brutally put down and seven people were killed in the process. Four days later, the European Union officially declared Nigeria's transition to civil rule program a failure. Abacha was working tirelessly to transmute himself into the next civilian president. He had the ambition to rule Nigeria at least until 2010, the year of his vision 2010. By 1998, Chief M.K. Wabiola, who was arrested in 1994 after declaring himself president, was still in detention. But his shadow looms so large that General Sami Abacha had to transfer him to a personal prison right within Asorok in Abuja. Sources close to the seat of power whispered that Abacha kept him under his personal surveillance so that he could take him hostage in case of any unforeseen military eventuality. Abiola was never released and eventually died in detention about a month after Abacha had died. Sani Abacha's paranoia became so obsessive that he trusted not even his own generals. With the help of the SSS and members of his strike force, he had a plan to implicate important elements in his regime, including his own deputy, Lieutenant General Oladi Podia, in a stage-managed coup plot. Most of those implicated were from the Yoruba tribe. I know this topic may trigger mixed emotions. We have covered this cool story exhaustively on this channel and I will leave links in the description if you want to learn more. Analysts believe Abacha used agent provocateurs to lure them into participating in a coup which he then videotaped at all critical stages. Having succeeded in trapping his former military collaborators whom he distrusted, 61 persons in all, including officers and civilians, were arrested and tried by a military tribunal for treason. After the trials, Lieutenant General Ladipudia and five others were condemned to death. But that was not all. Corruption was also a thing under Abacha. Abacha's regime was said to be very corrupt. During his regime, everything about Nigeria's oil wealth was centralized in the presidency. It is alleged that government revenue was recklessly spent in blind pursuit of personal power. In spite of loud noises about prudence in budgeting, the regime incurred a domestic debt of about 15.5 billion naira worth of treasury bills in 1997 alone. In fact, the total outstanding domestic debt increased from 221.8 billion naira in 1996 to 359.03 billion naira in 1997. It is said that little of these resources were spent on visible projects that would improve the welfare of the citizens. Rather, the money was siphoned away as kickbacks and used to line the pocket of soldiers and political agents. To this day, the Nigerian government still recovers millions of dollars stashed in foreign banks abroad belonging to him, his cronies, or his family members. In total, Abacha is alleged to have stolen between 3 to 5 billion dollars from Nigeria. At that time, Transparency International listed Abacha as the fourth most corrupt leader in the world. Consequently, within five years of his administration, the economy was in trouble. Indeed, prolonged period of foil scarcity in 1998 further worsened the situation for Nigerians and even affected the economy adversely. However, whether Abacha performed economically or not is not the subject of this video, and a video on this topic is coming shortly. By mid-1998, Nigeria under Abacha had attained a terrible image of gross human rights violations. Most Nigerians had begun to lose hope in their country and turned to prayers. For this group of people, Sani Abacha's sudden death was evidence that God answers prayers, and his death was greeted with spontaneous celebration across the country. For all the drama that happened within the last 24 hours before Abacha's death, click this video here next. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to Hispul Media, and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you very much for watching. Peace.